Hello and welcome. UVA Speaks is a podcast of Lifetime Learning, a division of the Office of Engagement at the University of Virginia. Lifetime Learning brings the knowledge and expertise of UVA's faculty to the university's alumni, friends, and families. My name is Susan Lynch, and I am the Associate Director of Lifetime Learning at the University of Virginia's Office of Engagement. This podcast features Christina lopez Catardi chow an Assistant Professor and Chair of Public Programming at the Miller Center at the University of Virginia. Her scholarship examines the evolving nature of U.S.-Cuban relations, the state of human rights on the island, and Cuba's opposition and dissident movement. The December 2014 change in U.S.-Cuba relations and the direct role played by President Obama in altering this policy has created an alignment between her core scholarship with a focus on the American presidency and, in particular, executive decision-making. In this podcast, Professor Lopez Catardi Chow will talk with us about the current issues impacting the people of Cuba and the current government. So thank you, Professor, for speaking with me today. It's great to be with you. Great. So first, can you provide an overview of the current political situation in Cuba? Sure. I think that despite some nuances that we can discuss, in many ways, Cuba has, in its very broad strokes, remained relatively unchanged politically during the span of 60 plus years of communist rule in Cuba. As you know, Fidel Castro first gained power um, in January of 1959, when he and his 26th of July movement uh, succeeded in overthrowing then President Fulgencio Batista. Fidel Castro then went on um, to famously surpass something like 10 U.S. presidents until he became ill in 2006. Um, He first temporarily and then in a more permanent fashion in 2008 uh, transferred power over to his brother Raul Castro, who at the time um, was in charge of the military as well as the country's sort of social control apparatus. So then Raul Castro, who today is in his 90s, then served as president. He also served as first secretary of Cuba's Communist Party until 2018, uh, when when power was then transferred to what is believed to have been his handpicked successor, uh, Miguel Diaz-Canal. Uh, Diaz-Canal is, is in his 60s. He came up through the ranks of the Communist Party, serving in several posts, including as uh, Minister of Higher Education, and then a few years later as Vice President. And so Diaz-Canal has then been leading the country for the last four years or so. So thank you so much for that background. Um, You know, you alluded to this a little bit, but did this change in leadership bring about policy changes or is this simply a continuation of Castro era policies? Yeah, so in in my view, I think it's been mostly a continuation of the Castro brothers approach, though I think it's worth noting that in 2021, Cuba held its eighth Communist Party Congress in which Raul Castro then stepped down um, from his position as head of the Communist Party which arguably is the most influential post within the Politburo. Um, So on the one hand, this was a noteworthy occurrence um, where Cuba watchers were paying close attention to. um, Though again, I think the succession to to Diaz-Canal had been well-planned, it was in the works. And so I think that allowed for for Cuba's leadership to maintain the the, the existing course. Um, We should also note that under Diaz-Canal, a new constitution was ratified in 2019 but again, of little importance in terms of real change or kind of affirming a new direction. Rather, it was a reaffirmation of the one-party system, um, making it irrevocable and with extremely modest changes in terms of commentary on economic or social dynamics. Um, I think that um, many would have predicted that any of these moments of transition, right, so 2006, 2008, 2018, then with Miguel Diaz-Canal, could have been opportunities for shifts Um, whether that was coming internally or from opposition on the outside, uh, that did not happen. And so I think it's it's it seems fair to say that there has been uh, tight control amongst elites um, to to maintain the the existing course. Great. So, you know, I've been reading about the economic crisis in Cuba. Can you please explain what is driving this situation? So Cuba's economic situation has been really dismal for some time. Growth this year was originally predicted to be at about 4%, um, according to Reuters uh, news agency. But that has, I've I've been reading kind of recent news on this, and that has now been adjusted to about 1% growth. So of course, global inflation is affecting all of us. It's it's, it's affecting things internationally. That is certainly a factor and a a dynamic that needs to be accounted for. Um, but I think it's, from my perspective, it's it's important to start with 
um, to note that while the regime likes to lay blame for all of its economic ills on the U.S. economic embargo, and certainly that has been a policy tool that has had its effect, I think fundamentally the negative economic situation on the island is due to a really a completely failed economic system that is centralized. It's largely nationalized um, based on very tight state control on the lack of a real private sector. And then add, its, add to that no desire and really fears, I think, on the part of the Cuban government to uh, consider shifts um, away from the existing model for fear that they might lose control otherwise. In more recent years, however, um, Cuba's economy has also been negatively impacted by COVID, um, as have all economies. Um, but related to that, a dramatic drop in tourism, which in the case of Cuba is a major income stream and sector for the island. And then also kind of going back a few years before that, the loss of uh, Venezuelan support, which was once a, life a lifeline to the Cuban government, given very close political ties between Fidel Castro and Hugo Chavez at the time, um, and then more recently um, under Venezuelan President uh, Nicolas Maduro. Uh, Cuba has made some efforts to attract uh, foreign investment, um, and they have succeeded with some partners, um, including China, Spain, Brazil, and others. But also worth noting that any foreign investments in Cuba um, need to take place in partnership with the Cuban government, which is essentially being in partnership with the Cuban military, um, who through a group called GAESA um, manages all economic investment activity. And so that, of course, then has its limitations. Thank you for that information. So, you know, in July 2021, there were reports of protests in Cuba. And can you provide an update on the protests? Yes. So um, as you said, on July 11th of 2021, which was a Sunday, just to give uh, folks the feel for sort of what the atmosphere was like, thousands of Cubans unexpectedly took to the streets in cities across the island. So these demonstrations were not just contained to the capital in Havana, um, but rather they took place in various cities, cities and provinces throughout Cuba. Um, obviously, such a scene is very rare there. And uh, people participating in the protests were making fairly basic demands that were related to um, asking for a change in living conditions as a result of shortages of, of food and medicine, um, also dealing with constant blackouts, so a lack of electricity across the island, uh, restrictive measures related to COVID-19 transmission, which has been, been an issue in other countries, obviously. And then I think all of this, um, again, useful to kind of frame this within the broader context of frustrations related to the state's longstanding repressive and, and social control measures. Uh, during the, the, the protests and then in the weeks that followed, the government began to detain hundreds of people. Uh, they kept activists and independent journalists under extreme surveillance. They cut off Internet access so that they could not communicate internally with one another and also with the international community. Uh, they also then uh, engaged in arbitrary detentions, violations in terms of due process. And then in the end, they held largely closed trials uh, where those uh, those that were accused were given prison sentences that range between seven and 30 years. So quite harsh. Um, you know, these were these taxes, unfortunately, I, I, I would like to say that this is this is not not a longstanding um, policy, but they are not new. In fact, the government's strategy has often been to criminalize offenses of this nature. So charging human rights activists or anyone that disagrees with the government with broad charges like public disorder, contempt, sedition, um, or inciting violence. Um, there were also some reports that President Diaz-Canal was calling on the population to uh, violently counter pro uh, demonstrators, arguing that they, quote, undermine the constitutional stability um, and, or, sorry, excuse me, the constitutional order and the stability of the socialist state. Um, so again, also very alarming. Um, it's also worth noting that these protests came at a time of renewed opposition activity in recent years particularly amongst groups of, act, of artists and musicians, some of which organize under an umbrella group known as the San Isidro movement. There has also been some activity that has galvanized around the Cuban rap band known as Gente de Zona. Um, they have a song by the title of Patria y Vida, which is a play on Fidel Castro's revolutionary call for Patria or, or Muerte. Um, so the lyrics in the song, the band, the people who have supported this are obviously very critical of the government. And, you know, this is a bit of, of, of conjecture on my part, but probably fair to say that uh, some of this, that this movement or the song or 
you know, um, could have led to some new awareness and activism on the part of the Cuban population. But more to your question about the current status of the protests, you might recall that in September of this year, so just a couple months ago, Hurricane Ian crossed the island, leading to further difficult difficulties for the population. Um, in this case, very specific to uh, power outages and electricity issues, um, which again prompted protests and people coming out on the streets, uh, particularly in the evenings. Um, these appear to have continued for several days and to my knowledge have been brought under control. But again, concerning that the government has threatened criminal charges for those who participated. Um, and it may be that given these two incidents of major protests in recent years, coupled with uh, record-breaking outward mig migration from the island, might be a sign that the population is reaching a boiling point or has reached a boiling point. And so we'll have to see where it goes from here, both in terms of how the government adapts and responds, and then likewise, how the population adapts and responds in kind. Interesting. Thank you so much. So uh, as a follow up to the protests, I'm interested in getting your take on the fact that there's been large scale protests happening worldwide, like in places like Iran and, and China most recently. That's uh, a great question. Yeah, yeah. So are there issues that link these protests or are they unique incidents uh, to these countries? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I think it's it's fascinating what's going on. Um, I think some of the obvious linkages are that while there are nuanced differences, of course, in terms of each of these governments, their leadership, what's happening on the ground in Iran, in China, elsewhere, um, all of these, you know, they do have in common that these are repressive societies that are going through these different unique challenges that, again, appear to have perhaps reached, their populations may have reached a boiling point. In China, of course, the protests are most immediately tied to frustrations over COVID restrictions in Iran, as you know. Um, they were sparked by the death of a 22-year-old woman um, for allegedly not wearing her hijab properly. Um, and then these initial protests in Iran then morphed into um, a broader range of grievances um, against, against the authoritarian regime there. Um, and then in Cuba, there's also, of course, been a litany of frustrations behind the protests as we've talked about, the economic situation, et cetera. Um, but so so these are certainly common dynamics. And then I think the question is, as I mentioned earlier, will be how will the, these governments respond? We're seeing some of the response um, in, in both Iran and in, um, and in China in recent days. Um, so how the government responds and then again, in turn, how the population responds. Um, and of course, this is a fascinating field of, of political science inquiry in terms of what dynamics and factors eventually lead to, re to regime change. And while some some are easy to identify, sometimes they happen unexpectedly and then they lead to 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 further movement. So um, I think I think we're just going to have to wait and see where where all of this goes from here. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, you know, and finally, um, what is the current status of U.S. Cuba relations? Yeah, I, I think in order to to understand the current state of U.S. Cuba relations, I think it's useful in my view to go back a couple administrations. So probably particularly to President Obama and changes that took place during and immediately after his tenure, just because it helps to contextualize President Biden's current approach. Mm -hmm. So, of course, most folks will recall that in 2014, President Obama famously moved to normalize uh, relations with Cuba, uh, restoring diplomatic ties. And in doing so, he initiated broad allowances in terms of U.S. travel to Cuba. That was really a new movement. Um, he increased remittance allowances, which are a major source of revenue for many Cubans who have ties to the United States. He opened the U.S. Embassy in Havana. Um, the United States and Cuba also participated in a prisoner exchange, somewhat maybe perhaps similar to what we're seeing in terms of which happened recently with Russia. So in this case, it was three convicted Cuban spies who were traded for a U.S. intelligence asset who had spent nearly two decades in Cuba's prisons. Uh, President Obama also removed Cuba from the state sponsor of terrorism list. And then in the last few weeks of his presidency, he ended the wet foot, dry foot immigration policy. Now, President Trump then came into office with a very different mandate. He felt that the United States had not gotten a fair deal under President o Obama. And he wanted to see, um, he was asking for and wanted to see more concessions and changes in terms of human rights as a precursor to further engagement. So then, of course, you know, we know that he largely reversed course, initiating new sanctions on Cuban government officials. He put restrictions in place in terms of allowable individual travel, um, as well as a cap on remittance amounts 
uh, the Trump administration also outlined restrictions on business activities between the two countries that were beginning to be explored under Obama. And then he added Cuba back to the state sponsor of terrorism list. Then in 2017, um, he moved to reduce U.S. embassy staff and activities um, in Havana as a result of the Havana syndrome that was affecting U.S. embassy personnel first in Havana, but then it it was being reported um, in other international outport, outposts. There have been a number of studies and investigations as to what was the origin of, of, of these issues. A lot of them had to do with hearing um, complaints about hearing loss and memory issues and headaches and that sort of thing. Um, but in the end, the source is not known, despite attempts to attempts to uncover that. Um, it's also worth noting in the case of President Trump that his view towards Cuba was also a bit of a also took a bit of a regional approach. So he kind of included in in the basket of Cuba, he included countries like Venezuela and Nicaragua, given some similarities in terms of of their governments, of their leadership, of repression issues. Um, concerns over human rights. And so he often would refer to these countries as sort of a threesome, calling them the troika of tyranny. Um, and so that was sort of the background narrative to what was driving some of his policies. Now, turning to the present day in terms of the Biden administration, um, the Biden administration has generally been fairly cautious in its in its approach. I think he um, he and his his um, advisors have learned about, you know, what was what was gained and not gained with Obama's detente. And then also kind of um, having some consideration for Trump era restrictions. Um, and of course, I think it's fair to say, like all U.S. presidents, um, they've been keenly, he is very keenly aware of the political calculations. And I think the significance historically of the Cuban American vote, particularly in Florida, which has been historically a swing state. And so that is a political calculation that all administrations make in terms of how they decide what course to take. Um, so he has been cautious, but he has then moved to lift remittance cap allowances. He's also begun to ease uh, travel restrictions that uh, not going all the way where Obama was, but um, lifting some of, of Trump's restrictions. And then in the last few weeks, the United States and Cuba have reengaged in migration talks. Um, as I mentioned earlier, outweighed, outward migration from Cuba is at historic and unprecedented levels. Uh, the numbers um, have are, are upwards of 200,000 in the last year, and these are now coming both um, through the Florida Straits as as rafters or um, as as we typically know Cuban um, arrivals, but also now through kind of the Central American route and at the Mexican border um, as a result of some uh, new visa um, easing of re visa restrictions via Nicaragua. Um, so as a result of these recent talks, um, Cuba has agreed to begin receiving deportation flights um, from the United States of Cubans who are being repatriated. And then the U.S. has also agreed to begin restoring visa and consular services in Cuba. So we'll have to wait. There's still more time in the Biden administration, and we'll see what 2024 brings in terms of of, um, of that election. But uh, we'll have to wait and see if if this is where he this is as far as the administration wants to go or if there will be further changes in one direction or another. So I wonder too, if you just quickly, if you could give some understanding of the role of the Cuban American vote. Yeah, so as I mentioned, um, the Cuban American vote has been a force in presidential politics for as long as, as, as I've been alive. Um, and I will mention on a personal note, you know, my parents were born in Cuba. Um, I was first, I'm first generation born in the United States, born in Miami, which is sort of the heart of the Cuban American community. Um, and I think the history goes back really to the 1980s and to President Reagan, um, who did a lot um, in terms of U.S. Cuba policy, specifically in terms of initiating and instituting uh, radio in Cuba, uh, radio and TV Marti, um, and having a kind of a harder stance, a hardline approach towards um, towards Cuba being in favor of the embargo. And so I think that, um, you know, significant members of the Cuban American community, particularly the historic exile, um, or what we consider the historic exile. So the generation of my grandparents and my parents, for the most part, of course, there's variations, but um, in large part, um, with having an alignment with the Republican Party. There have been some shifts. Um, and so, and, and Trump has added an interesting dynamic to that. And we'll see where that goes. Um, again, in 2024, there's new dynamics at play. Um, but uh, yeah, there's, there's there's a long history of 
of Florida being an important swing state with Cuban Americans, uh, which total about two million in exile, um, having a strong voice in those those politics that then can have national um, national repercussions. Thank you for that. Um, I've always been curious about that, and that gives me some great information. So thank you so much, uh, Professor Lopez Katari Chow, um, for sharing this information about your scholarship and the issues impacting the people of Cuba today. This is very interesting. And I'm sure that uh, many of our UVA alumni, friends and families will be interested in hearing this and learning more about Cuba. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. I appreciate your interest. Great. Thank you. And thank you for listening for upcoming podcasts and other lifetime learning programming, recordings, and blogs. Please visit our website at engagement.virginia.edu forward slash learn. You can also find our podcasts on Spotify and with the Virginia Audio Collective, which is a network of UVA podcasts hosted by WTJU Radio and can be found at virginiaaudio.org. So thanks again, and we look forward to you taking part in future lifetime learning programs.